Does this sound like fun? It is very exciting, very exciting that that uh, assignment. And there are some more things there that you can read about the tasks and submission. And I've given you a template to fill out, just like <coughs> assignment one. I love templates. Like I use them for everything. So you fill out a template again in assignment two. And you fill it out seven times. Seven different images. <coughs> and somebody had the very good suggestion of like creating a short screen capture demo or a little movie from assignment one that shows how you interact with the tool. So that is part of assignment two. Because when you look at 3D, 3D data, interaction is extremely important because you need the ability to rotate the volume. So in this assignment, you're given the chance to demonstrate rotating the volume. And you'll see how important that is. OK, if there are any questions or comments, please feel free to ask me, interrupt at any time. This class is very polite. Like nobody interrupts me. <laughs> but I welcome interruptions. It's fine. Yeah. And this is the attendance register, the one that I like to use myself. I'm picking up another signal from somebody's mind in the room saying, I really enjoyed assignment one. But assignment one has massive transferable skills. Like you can you can use those skills from assignment one at any job. Like, whatever job you end up taking, you can use those skills. And not only in any job, but in your personal life, too. So, Sorry, excuse me. Sorry, is this yep. just the master sheet? It should be so two sheets. You have two of the master sheet with the same sheet. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Finally, somebody interrupts me. <laughs> so today we're going to continue where we left off last week and the isosurface extraction algorithm. This is a non-trivial algorithm. So some of you probably are going to get lost on some of the steps. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not unusual. But luckily, you can review those steps you get lost on by watching the lecture recording, for example, or reading the recommended reading at the end of the lecture notes, and also post it on Blackboard. So last time, we started by talking about the terms isosurface and isovalue. We discussed what isosurfaces are, what they're useful for, and then we finished by discussing the marching squares algorithm in detail. So the marching squares algorithm is the 2D version of the marching cubes algorithm. And it's very good to understand the simpler marching squares algorithm before jumping into the 3D version of the marching cubes algorithm. Very, very helpful. So, the approximating an isosurface as, to, as opposed to an isocontour from last time. So the idea is to examine the volume data on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. 
That means the isosurface cuts the volume and each cell is searched. Remember, I don't know if anybody can remember the, the very first lecture when I said that data visualization, everything surrounding data is essentially a search process. Actually, your whole life is a search process. That's all we do. We're always searching for something, right? Food, dry, dry room, whatever. <clears throat> so this is a search process. Surprise, surprise. Each cell is searched. We divide the isosurface search into per volume, per volume cell representation and use triangles. So this is a so-called cell, which is uh, eight vertices that form a cube. And that's where the data, the volumetric data, is stored. And we search this cell for inter isosurface intersections. So here's a cell and a sample isosurface that intersects the cell. And then we approximate the surface with this triangle. And here's what it looks like as well. By the way, I, I uh, just happened to look on YouTube as well. There's a very cool animation of, of marching cubes now on, on isosurfacing that didn't exist last time I checked, like a year ago. So it's really, it's really cool. So here are the eight steps of the marching cubes algorithm. This has been a test question on in past years. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be. It's not a test question every year, but it sometimes is a test question. <clears throat> so a cell consists of of eight voxel values, or eight data values, stored at the corners of a cube, and they're given an index, right? an index. So step one is to examine a cell, or search a cell, is another way of thinking of it. We classify each vertex corner as inside or outside the isosurface, above or below the iso value. We build an index that doesn't make any sense from this slide. We use that index to match a list of triangles, or we get an edge, a, a get an edge list from the table. So this, this index is, is to retrieve an edge list from a table that's pre-computed before we start the algorithm. We interpolate edge locations or intersections of the isosurfaces along those edges, just like we did last, last Monday in the isocontours algorithm. We compute gradients. <coughs> that was not part of the iso of the marching cubes algorithm. I'm sorry, matching squares from last time. We consider ambiguous cases and then we move on to the next cell. So it's like a big for loop for each cell do the following steps. Anybody happen to remember what we call that in the introductory lecture on volume visualization? That's a really difficult question because probably you've all forgotten that by now. But we called it an object order algorithm. Like for each cell in 3D do something as opposed to an image order algorithm, which was for each pixel, do something. So now we're traversing a 3D volume. So the next slides are trying to explain each of these steps in more detail. Some of them are easy, and some of them are quite, dif well, are difficult to understand. So step one is not very difficult to understand. It's looking at a, constructing a cell of, of eight vertices. That's not too difficult to understand. The input to marching cubes is a volume data set. <coughs> and the output is a set of triangles that represent a surface. In this case, it's an isosurface. That volume data set is subdivided into cubes. 
for example, 256 cubed cubes, <laughs> 256 along x, along y, and along z. That's a standard kind of subdivision <coughs> of some volume data. And each, each corner, the data is stored at the corners, and each corner gets an index. Here, the, it, this lower left corner is index i, j, k. Here it's i plus 1, j, k. We move backwards, it's i plus 1, j plus 1, k, and so on. So i is along the x direction, j is along the, the depth direction in this, in this slide, and then k is along the height or the y direction. So that's not difficult to understand. Step two is also not particularly difficult to understand. We classify each voxel according to whether it lies outside the surface or inside the surface. So this value is the value stored at the corners of the cube, so a corner value. We evaluate it to see if it's greater than an isosurface value or less than or equal to the chosen isosurface value. So I'll back up and say the input to the marching cubes algorithm is the volume data and an ISO value. So the user chooses it, typically chooses an ISO value and says, show me the surface that corresponds to this ISO value. So in this, this value is referring to these corners. So let's look at an example. For a given ISO value, for example, 9, we ask ourselves, is 10 above or below, no, I'm sorry, is 9 above or below 10? Right? It, it's below. So in, in this slide, that means it's, it's this case, the value 10 is greater than the ISO surface value which in this, in this example is 9. And therefore, it's outside the surface. And this is annotated with these blue, the vertices have now changed into colors. So here we have data values that are outside, outside, outside. So 10, 10, 10. Those three values are all greater than 9. And then the other values are less than 9. So we, we can imagine just traversing, inspecting each corner in order, 8 is below, 8 is below, 8 is below, 10 is above, 5 is below, 5 is below, 10 is above, and 10 is above. So systematically comparing the ISO value with the given data value and classifying each vertex as inside or outside or on either side. You know, we're basically looking for those, those areas where the ISO value falls between the data values, just like in the marching squares algorithm we went over on, on last Monday. So here, with an ISO value of 9, these three are outside the surface. <coughs> and if we change the ISO value to 7, the, the tests, the results also change. So only two of the data values are below 7 or equal to 7 in that case. So the, result, the cube looks different. The results are different. It's a different surface. So a different surface will pass through the, through the cell. So far, so good. And then we use those, that, that information, those eight tests, those are eight tests, because there are eight quarters of the cube. We use those eight tests, which, which yield true or false in every case. Right? This is above you know, our ISO value, true or false. And we use that to build a unique index. <coughs> so in this case, if, if V1 is inside, so 
inside is depicted by one, then our index, and, and we label each of our, our corners, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, V7, and the value of those <coughs> indices is, is stored in this index, the value of these vertices. So in this case, the vertices that represent inside 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. So that's, that means a 1 is stored at positions 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, or inside vertices that fell below the ISO value in this example. In this example, this vertex is on outside. This is outside, so V1, V2 is outside. Outsides get uh, result in a zero index, a zero bit, I should say, in the index. And then these two are inside, so we, we have a one bit in the index corresponding to the third and fourth vertices. And the rest of the vertices, V5, V6, V7, and V8, are outside the surface, and each of those gets a zero bit for the index. So probably I just lost some people there. That's what my psychic powers are telling me. But it's okay. You can you can review this. I think it I think it's very difficult to understand this the first time. I think you need to see all the steps and then go back and review them all again after you've seen the whole thing, if that makes any sense. You need to see the whole thing and then go back and look at all the steps again to make to see how they fit together. <coughs> so step four, for a given index, access an array storing a list of edges. Those are edge intersection edges. And all 256 cases can be derived from 15 base cases due to symmetries, reflection and rotation symmetry. So what does that mean? This is 8 bits. 2 to the 8th is 256. There can only be 256 combinations of those bits. 2 to the 8th is, is 256. So you can get, you can build a table with all 256 indices, different indices. You can build one table. It has 256 rows. And for each row is a unique index. So you can, pre you can know that ahead of time. You know <coughs> that an index can only have 256 different values. And that means the isosurface or this configuration, can, this, this tests, can only result in 256 different cubes, basically. All the 256 cubes can be boiled down to 15 <coughs> unique cases due to rotation and reflection symmetry. What does that mean? So here's a case. Anybody know what this corresponds to? This empty, this empty cell? No intersections. What's your name? That's so awesome. So he's got, he's, he's on top of it so far. So all of these, all of these corner, the data values at the corners either fell below or above. All eight of them. So there's no intersection. The isosurface doesn't intersect that cube at all. And it's not, so all the, the indices, now that's, that's going to be, that's going to result in redundant table, tables, uh, lookups, like all zeros or all one. And it's going to result multiple times because we can rotate this cube and it's the same thing. If we rotate it, the result is exactly the same. And if we flip it, 
the result is exactly the same. So rotation is, that's what I mean by rotation symmetry. If we rotate it, the result is exactly the same, the cube looks the same. If we flip it 180 degrees, it looks the same. How about this one? Can anybody tell me what this corresponds to? Your name? That's uh, Joe. Joe. That singular bit is different from the other bits. That's right. There's one, there's one corner or one data value that is inside the surface. If I remember, is blue? Oh, blue is outside. Blue is outside. It doesn't actually matter too much if you switch the inside and outside. So there's one data value on one side of the surface, and all the other seven are on the other side of the isosurface. That's what that corresponds to. And so you'll have a, 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 an index that's just one bit, and the rest is zeros, for example, or a zero and all ones. That's what that will correspond to. And you'll have other entries in the table that look very similar to this because if I rotate this by 90 degrees, it's rotationally symmetric, right? It's the same thing, but it's been rotated by 90 degrees. And you can rotate it three, three or four times and then along different axes and get eight different, basically eight different um, entries in the table that are the same equivalents. So notice how there's a triangle here, and that's what these edges are. We're going to talk about these edges in the next slide. Here's another configuration with two data samples on one side of the isosurface, and the others are not. They're on the other side. <coughs> And these are all the unique combinations. These, this is what the 15 cells can look like. So every, every cell in the 256 combinations is, a, is one of these cases due to symmetry. They start simple. This one's easy to imagine. This one's easy to imagine. That one's easy to imagine. This one's easy to see. This one starts to get a little bit complicated because there's one, two, three. It's hard to see there. One, two, three data samples on one side <coughs> of the isosurface and five on the other. This one's easy to see and understand. It's just the surface, the isosurface is cutting the cube right in half. So that's easy. Here it gets more complicated. We have three here on one side, and then another one disjoint on the other side over here. Here it's confusing because we have one, two, three, four, and they're all disconnected, but on the same side of the isosurface, and so on. <clears throat> and here you can start to see the value of rotation because it's not that easy to see what's happening here but it would be easier to see if we could rotate it, and so on. So there are some complicated configurations in there. Some of them are easy, and some of them are complicated. This one's easy, and this one's easy, but this one's complicated. So this is step four, part two. <clears throat> We can, we can pre-compute a, a lookup table that matches indices to edges. These are edges. That's what the E stands for. So for example, this index, 10111001, did I say that right? 10110001 corresponds to these edges, this, sets, this set of edges. So triangle one is three edge intersections. Where do I find those? Here is an edge intersection, E4. E7 is here. And then E11 is here. See those three edge intersections? 
It's because <coughs> the vertices are on opposite sides of the isosurface. So this, these are on opposite sides, these two are on opposite sides, and these two are on opposite sides of the isosurface. So therefore, the isosurface cuts through the cell, intersecting these three edges. That's a little bit difficult to understand. <clears throat> but that's one triangle. So everybody see that those three intersections formed a triangle. Here's a, and by the way, we're forming triangles because surfaces are usually composed of triangles in computer graphics. That's, well, that's a, one way to represent a surface. Question? Going to the previous example, um, I hope you have a case where all the um, vertices are sort of intersected. If you would have multiple disconnected. Yes, you can. It, it's this case. It's this case actually. So the the um, so you're asking, can't you have a case where there are eight triangles, like one here at each corner? That's the same as this one. It means that all the data values are on one side of the isosurface, so it misses the whole thing. What we're looking for, what we're searching for, is two data values that are on both sides of the isosurface. So in the one you just described, all the data values are on the same side of the <coughs> isosurface. Yeah. And that will make, I, I talked about that kind of a lot in last week, uh, yeah, last week in the, in the marching squares algorithm. So feel free to review that, uh, the marching squares algorithm. Another question? Name? Yeah. Joe. Joe. When we're deciding the triangles, how, how do we sort of choose which edges make up each triangle? So why have we choose, chosen edge 4, 7, 11 when we could have had maybe 11, 7, 6? That's a good question. We don't have to choose. We, we pre-compute the table that matches the index to the triangles. It's pre-computed. So you don't have to choose. But when we pre-compute that, uh, is there some sort of already decided list that we sort of compute or like so? Yeah. Somebody else has pre-computed it for you. Yeah, so you don't have to pre-compute it. Yeah, that's the good news. So somebody pre-computed it once back in 1980, I guess in 1986 or 1987, and that was it. Like nobody had to re pre it again <laughs> as far as I know I'm sure probably some people did but <clears throat> and what about triangle 2 triangle 2 is edge E1 where is edge E1 here edge 7 here and then edge 4 here everybody see that there's a triangle that spans, that intersects those three edges. And again, it's because these two are on opposite sides of the isosurface. These two are, as well as these two. So whenever you have two data samples on opposite sides of the isosurface, you get an intersection. Just like we talked about last week. And then triangle three, edge one, edge six, and edge seven. So there's those intersections with the corresponding triangle. And then the last triangle is E1, E10, E6, E1, E10, and E6. So that's a complicated case. That's, that's like, by the way, anytime you see a matching pair one zero or a zero one right after each other that corresponds to an edge intersection because we've changed we've passed from one one side of the isosurface to the other side every time the bit flips it represents a change in the 
from one side to the other side of the isosurface. If you understood that, you're really paying good attention. But if you didn't, it's okay, because you can review it. <clears throat> By the way, I did not understand every single step of this algorithm the first time I heard it either. What I did, and there, was, uh, there wasn't the, the amazing uh, recorded lectures either, where I could rewatch the lecture. What I did to understand it was I read the research paper. So this is a summary of a research paper called the March and Cubes algorithm, and I just read the research paper, and then I understood it. Like, or at least, yeah, then I thought like, I understood it. So that's step four. Step five. For each triangle edge, find the vertex location along the edge losing linear interpolation of the voxel values. So we computed just edge intersections, like which edge the isosurface <coughs> intersects, but then we interpolate along the edges to make the edge intersection locations accurate. Hopefully everybody remembers this linear interpolation uh, exercise we did, I think, two weeks ago, or was it just a week ago? I think maybe it was just a week ago, actually. Yeah, I guess it was just a week ago. So, for example, if, if, this, if, if the green represents data samples of 10, the value 10 stored at these corners, and, and the blue represents a value of zero, t equals five, the ISO value five, will actually be halfway between zero and ten. And that's not a very difficult case. It doesn't look like halfway in this slide, but it will be halfway, like the value of five is halfway between zero and ten. And, and that's true about all three of these edge intersections in this case. But what if we change the ISO value to 8? Then the intersections would be more, would be closer to 10, the value of 10. 8 is closer to the value of 10 than 0, intuitively speaking. So the edge intersections are going to be closer. You could, you, we can also say they're going to be 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent towards the distance towards the tens. So we get an intersection close to 10 here, 80% the distance, here as well, and here as well. So it's the same triangle, in, you know, the same topology, or the same edge intersections, but the triangle has shifted. It's shifted its place. It's a little bit bigger in this, in this case. In this case, it's smaller. <clears throat> this is where it starts to get abstract. This, I would say it's very easy to get lost on this slide. You mean the, the uh, outward direction, the normal? Yeah. Yes, you, you need to have the normal, but that's okay. There's, there are standard ways of computing a triangle normal. Like you don't, you can compute the triangle normal just by um, the cross, well, the cross product of three of the vertices. But so you don't have to worry about it. It's, it's a, like a solve. Right. I mean, like, how do you know what side of the sort of, uh, intersection should we count as the ones that are included? It's up to you. You just follow a convention like this one. Like, if it's below the ISO value, it's inside. If it's above the ISO value, it's outside. You just follow a convention. So, in this case, there are normal, those green arrows are normal vectors. And those normal vectors are important for lighting and shading purposes. 
right? In computer graphics, if you want to apply lighting and shading to a surface, you need the normal vectors to the surface. And that's what these green arrows are, are showing here. So it's, it's up to you. Uh, you know, you could, you could have actually the, the normals, all, as long as they're consistent in the other direction, if you wanted to. It just has to be consistent. And you can compute normals very consistently. You just, for example, you take the cross product of vertex 0 and 1 with the cross product of vertex 0 and 2. The cross product, um, you know, you, you point your fingers along the first vector. Everybody know the right hand rule? You point your fingers along the first vector, curl them towards the second vector, <coughs> and then the, your thumb points in the normal direction. That's one way, it's not the only way to compute uh, triangle normals. There are other ways to. <clears throat> so this is about, this slide is actually about computing the, the shading. So we need shading in order to shade the surface but we have no uh, shading information stored in the volume. The volume is just a set of data samples on a Cartesian grid, 3D <coughs> Cartesian grid. And here we can derive shading information. We can synthesize it. We can just make it up. <clears throat> so we can calculate the normal at each cube vertex using central differences. And those normals can be used to shade the surface. That's, that's one, you know, one step of the algorithm. So, for, for example, how could we compute the normal, a, a, a vertex normal at this vertex? We can use something called, so, so a, a, a vector is composed of three components in this case, x, y, and z. So if we want to compute a normal vector, we need to compute three components. And that's what these three components are, g, x, g, y, and g, z, the three components of a normal vector. How can we derive them or just make them up, so to speak? We can use the data, we can examine the data itself and just subtract this data value from the one on the other side or vice versa, subtract this data value which we're not seeing on the slide from this data value. That's sy just synthesizing the x component of the normal vector. And we can do that for the y component and the z component as well. So to get the z component, for example, we can just subtract this data value, which is not shown on the slide, you have to imagine it, from this data value. And you get the y component of the normal vector. And for the z component, you just subtract this data value from this one, which we're not seeing, along the z direction in 3D space. So we got three components of the normal vector. We just derive the normal vector. That normal vector is the, here. That's what this, this arrow is indicating, like a derived normal vector at that vertex. And if we want, to, if we want that normal vector to correspond to a, a triangle vertex, we have to linearly interpolate these two vectors. So we derive a normal at each cube vertex, and then we use linear interpolation to, to assign that to the triangle vertex, the corresponding triangle vertex. That's a very abstract slide, and it abstracts a step. But the idea is we're computing and deriving normal vectors that we can apply for the, to the isosurface. That's the idea behind it. Central differences, by the way, is a nice term. It's a nice formulation. It just means compute the value at the center as a difference 
between the neighbors. So here's a neighbor and here's a neighbor. We take their difference, that's what the central differences part is, and we assign that difference at the center. It's a nice, I like that phrase actually, using central differences. So that's a, that's a, difficult, a difficult step to understand. How are we doing on time? Uh, <coughs> should we stop or should we keep going? Any votes? Do we be like democratic? Is this, there's another class I think waiting, isn't there? Yeah. I guess we'll stop here. There are two more steps. And then we'll finish this evening. Thanks, everyone. Everybody have a copy of assignment two. Any extra copies somewhere? This I went to. Extra copies of assignment two somewhere, nobody? Oh. Can I? Yep, I should take a copy. Oh.